As we saw in NES Works 1987, Konami delivered a true classic with Castlevania for NES. But that was hardly the company's only take on the Simon Belmont story. The question is, did those vampiric adventurers suck blood, or did they just plain suck? That's the topic of this episode, and the next, of NES Works Guide In. Castlevania, that is, Akumajo Dracula, showed up on Nintendo's Famicom Disk System in October of 1986. It would also show up on the Nintendo Entertainment System about six months later with a revised difficulty level and no save feature. But that wasn't the only take on Simon Belmont's story that showed up in October of 1986. There was also Akumajo Dracula, aka Vampire Killer, for the MSX home computer. Konami was the biggest software supporter of the MSX home computer standard by a fair margin. The MSX2 hardware was roughly as capable as the stock NES, and unlike with a closed Nintendo-owned ecosystem of the NES and Famicom, Konami didn't have to pay licensing fees to publish on MSX. As a result, quite a few of the classic Konami franchises that most Americans associate with the NES either got their start on MSX or else existed on MSX and NES in parallel. Such was the case for Castlevania. Akumajo Dracula for MSX2, also known as Vampire Killer in its scarce European release, is the Funhouse Mirror Universe version of Castlevania. It includes all the same stages as the NES game, the same enemies, renditions of the same music, and even its visuals look as close to the NES versions as was possible with MSX hardware. Yet the similarities between the two fade away once you look beyond the superficial. Each game draws from the same font of inspiration. A meathead with a whip travels through a spooky movie monster castle to fight Count Dracula, but each take on Simon Belmont's quest reflects the nature of its respective platform. Castlevania is a console game through and through. Players are given three lives, and Infinite continues to make their way through six levels filled with fast-moving enemies and tricky jumping challenges, collecting power-ups and treasures worth high-score bonus points along the way. Vampire Killer is very much a microcomputer interpretation of arcade gaming. While the MSX game moves at a rapid clip for a computer game, its action is much less convincing than Castlevania's. Enemies appear in less thoughtful locations, where every monster spawn in Castlevania shows up where it has the greatest impact, testing the limits of the game's controls and the hero's capabilities without feeling impossibly unfair, the placement of monsters on MSX has a far more haphazard nature. Many monsters spawn infinitely. Others show up in locations that can only be countered safely if players memorize a precise sequence of actions in order to make use of one-time power-ups. The creatures of Dracula's castle behave more erratically on MSX than on NES, with Medusa heads moving in far more exaggerated sine wave patterns that make them harder to hit, and armored foes often twitching backward to crowd Simon against walls. Even the miserable excuse for a first boss on NES, the giant bat, is a truly daunting foe on MSX with no readily available counter. Compare that to the NES game, which provides you with an axe and a shot multiplier to ensure you can take out the bat in a matter of seconds. And Simon himself is very different here too. His whip is far less potent on MSX than on NES, with a tiny hitbox that makes it more difficult to land a blow on the already more challenging monsters he faces here. On top of that, the whip isn't even his old faithful standby for combat. Where subweapons on NES serve as limited complements to Simon's permanent whip, here all the subweapons outside the Holy Water and Stopwatch replace the whip. Even more bizarrely, these replacements can be even more impermanent than the subweapons on NES. Where those were powered by expendable heart collectibles, here they're limitless, unless you screw up. The boomerang, for example, is incredibly useful as long as you catch it on its return flight. Where the boomerang on NES is a versatile fire-and-forget weapon that lets you fill the screen with powerful actions as you move around, here you really need to pay attention to the movement of the boomerang. And god forbid you need to throw it on a moving platform while under attack by monsters, as the simple act of evasion will almost definitely cause you to miss its return flight. All these mechanical differences from the NES game give Vampire Killer a sort of bootleg feel, the way so many non-core Castlevania titles do. It's hard to impress on newcomers just how tightly crafted the NES game's design truly is until you experience this. The same game, but where everything feels looser, sloppier, and less carefully considered. Except they're not really the same game, are they? While both Castlevania and Vampire Killer consist of six levels, each containing three substages apiece, the nature of these environments is wildly different across the two platforms. 
There's no mystery or freedom in Castlevania. It's a linear trek through Dracula's castle from start to finish. In fact, a big part of the game's appeal comes from the exquisite internal logic of its environments. Each stage of Castlevania begins with a representation of Simon's path on a map scroll that doesn't simply reflect the actual route he'll be taking, but shows where in or beneath the castle it's meant to be. It's the Ghost and Goblins stage map preview taken to the next level. But even beyond this abstract representation, every bit of architecture in the castle makes sense. There are no floating platforms on NES, and any time you have to leap over pits, background wall and rock tiles appear to drive home the impression that Simon is navigating spaces that were designed as a functional castle environment before being worn away by erosion and the rot of undead centuries. Vampire Killer makes no such effort to reconcile its spaces. In fact, it thrives on illogic and making sense-defying physical design a core principle of its challenge. The MSX platform spec lacked the NES's support for smooth linear scrolling. Sometimes Konami shrugged and said, whatever, and put together MSX games that scrolled awkwardly in chunks. With Vampire Killer, on the other hand, they looked to microcomputer action games like Impossible Mission and Jet Set Willy, dividing up the castle environments into discrete, standalone screens. Every screen of Vampire Killer exists as a self-contained combat puzzle, and when Simon transitions from one screen to another, enemies and hazards don't follow. Except again, they're not really self-contained challenges. While active threats here are hemmed in by the edges of each screen, the castle itself connects from screen to screen in strange and often surprising ways. This becomes evident from the first level in which trekking straight ahead in the NES Castlevania style causes Simon not to reach the door to the next substage, but rather to wrap back around to the entrance. Instead, you need to venture up and down stairways to find the door and the key to open it. In the process, you'll also uncover treasure chests that require keys as well. These may contain cash or hearts or even power-ups that boost Simon's speed or jump skills until he ventures into the next substage. Many of the essential items you collect here can only be uncovered by attacking walls, which frequently break away to reveal secrets, including merchants who will sell you bonus items in exchange for hearts, not strangely for cash. Each substage becomes a self-contained puzzle that challenges you to unravel its mysteries while battling awkwardly through a host of infinite monsters and trying not to lose your weapons. Things become especially tricky once you reach the third stage, the castle's upper walls, where you begin to encounter an unintuitive wrinkle, stages that loop on the vertical axis as well as horizontally. I say unintuitive because the second stage features plenty of tricky jumps that teach you not to fall into pits because you'll die if you do. But suddenly, once you reach the third stage, certain pits will cause Simon not to die, but rather to loop back up to the top tier of screens in a substage. Doing so may allow you to collect otherwise inaccessible power-ups, bypass impossible challenges, or even reach a door to the next substage which would otherwise be too high to jump up to. The game grows in complexity the further you trek, with the greatest example of the difference between the two releases coming in the corridor leading to the fight with Frankenstein's creature. On NES, this is nothing more than a narrow passage populated by a handful of bone dragons. On MSX, the arches in the background work as functional doors, and the entire substage locks you into an infinite loop until you manage to navigate your way through the correct sequence of doors. What exists as a brief and daunting test of reflexes on NES becomes a confusing mental test on MSX. All of this makes for a fascinating alternate take on the NES classic, sadly undermined by how poorly it plays as an action game. If responsive controls and spot-on stage design of the NES game are absent here, leaving you to imagine how incredible this game could have been if it combined those environments and puzzles with the perfect mechanics of the NES game. Cruelly, Konami expected players to complete the adventure with three lives and no continues, or else to shell out for the Game Master, an official Konami-made cartridge that plugged into the MSX's secondary port and allowed players to give Simon infinite lives. An early example of pay-to-win decades before the advent of DLC. It's a bit of a miss overall, but Vampire Killer nevertheless set a precedent for the Castlevania franchise that would be followed up sooner than later, and would eventually become a defining component of the franchise's genetic makeup. While it's easy to ding Vampire Killer for not quite getting Castlevania right, you have to give its creators credit for the ambition with which they attempted to transform a crisp NES action game into something better suited for the MSX hardware. The Konami arcade team deserves no such credit for their own take on Castlevania, the utterly dire coin-op mess known in the US as Haunted Castle. A lot of Konami arcade works from the mid-80s actually look and play a lot worse than their beloved NES counterparts. Consider the original Contra, which was fairly enjoyable in arcades, but truly came into its own when it was adapted to NES. The discrepancy between NES and coin-op was even more unfavorable with Haunted Castle, though. 
which is strange because the dev team had ample opportunity to take notes from the home release, which shipped nearly two years prior to this rendition. Yet somehow this is a clumsier, uglier, messier, less enjoyable interpretation of the basic rules of Castlevania. It draws almost nothing from Vampire Killer except for the fact that the whip was prone to being replaced by less useful alternate weapons like a sword. Simon moves awkwardly here even as monsters pop up constantly and unpredictably, mercilessly whittling down his health. Clearly the Haunted Castle team had their eyes on Ghosts and Goblins. Specifically, that game's basic belief that arcade titles should treat players with hate and be generally impossible to complete on a single coin or at all. It's also stunningly hideous. The sprites are chunky and poorly drawn, the color choices are also poor, a combination of lifeless browns and garish neons, and the odds are stacked against players in a much less engaging way than in the NES game. And make no mistake, this is an adaptation of the NES game. It features largely the same environmental concepts, ranging from a statuary to a clock tower to a bat-haunted bridge leading to Dracula's lair. The enemies are largely drawn from the NES game as well, although there are some new additions to the bestiary. Actually, the most interesting parts of the game are the points at which it throws something unexpected and new into the mix, like the surreal moment where time freezes briefly around Simon as he appears to battle his way through some sort of dimensional shift. It doesn't really make any sense, but that just makes it more memorable. It is, in short, just not any fun. Annoyingly, the game only allows a limited number of continues, so even pumping quarters into the machine doesn't guarantee victory. You actually have to memorize this mess. So is there any saving grace to Haunted Castle at all? Only one, the soundtrack. Haunted Castle contains the first of many, many remakes of existing Castlevania tunes including some absolutely stunning FM synth-based renditions of Bloody Tears from the recently released Castlevania II. It's almost enough to justify this game's existence. Almost. A few years after Haunted Castle, Konami would revisit Simon's adventure once again with its first attempt to take the Castlevania series into 16 bits, Super Castlevania IV. I've already gone into a fair amount of detail about what does and doesn't work in this game over on Super NES Works, but it's worth noting that this too is definitely a retelling of the original Castlevania. You can tell by its Japanese title, see? Even though the games covered in this episode feature wildly different titles in English, they all shared a common name in Japan, Akumajo Dracula, or roughly Demon Castle Dracula. Castlevania, Vampire Killer, Haunted Castle, Super Castlevania 4, and Castlevania Chronicles were all simply Akumajo Dracula in Japan. And as such, they worked around the same basic premise. Simon Belmont makes his way to the top of Count Dracula's castle and kills the dude before he can drink humanity's collective blood or whatever it is he's after. Super Castlevania 4 follows most of the major beats of the original Castlevania, including making use of the same power-up mechanics. Simon can upgrade his whip a couple of times, collect the same set of sub-weapons, and enhance them with shot multipliers. Yet this game clearly came after Castlevania 2 and 3, meaning that it expands Simon's journey to reach Dracula to encompass more than just fighting through the castle. You don't reach Castlevania proper until about midway through the adventure, a journey tracked by way of a dual format map reminiscent of the one in Castlevania 3, which in turn was informed by Simon's journey across Transylvania in Castlevania 2. Still, it's clearly an expansion of the original Castlevania, rather than an adaptation of Castlevania 3. It's Simon, not Trevor, battling alone, and there are no branching pathways along his route. All of the original game's bosses make an appearance, too, often in new and exciting forms. The giant bat is now the Zapth Bat, a jewel-encrusted beast, and you fight the twin mummies on the hands of the massive clock tower. More significantly, Simon himself appears much larger on the screen, and his enhanced whip skills allow him to strike in eight directions. He can also use his whip as a sort of grappling hook for swinging across chasms and reaching inaccessible platforms. Of course, the boost in Simon's on-screen scale and his newfound whip skills largely negate the importance of his sub-weapons, which offer barely more reach and versatility than his innate attacks. It's a game that means well and attempts to push forward the series on the technological front, just taking those detailed visuals, zany Mode 7 effects, and all that sublime music. but it ends up being a little too bogged down by series traditions to truly make the leap. Still, compared to previous alternate takes on the original Castlevania, Super Castlevania 4 is a masterpiece. It's mechanically solid, boasts magnificent audio-visual quality, and harnesses Super NES technology to interesting effect. Though less perfectly crafted than the original Castlevania, it's a fascinating alternate take on the game, and a pretty fun one, too. And finally, the last of Konami's Castlevania reinventions, 
Akumajo Dracula for X68000 home computers, or Castlevania Chronicles as it's known to Americans, might best be seen as an attempt to apologize for Haunted Castle, or maybe put things right. Or maybe it's just a way to reframe Super Castlevania 4 in a more traditional Castlevania style. Whatever the case, it's great. The X68000 was essentially a late 90s arcade machine masquerading as a desktop computer, running on the same beefy Motorola 68000 processor that powered contemporary arcade boards by Sega and Capcom, as well as the Amiga and Macintosh home computers. It's the same processor that would later drive the Sega Genesis, albeit in a less powerful form for the budget-friendly console. Castlevania Chronicle was a fairly late release for the platform, shipping in 1993, as Konami tried to figure out exactly how to move the franchise forward beyond 8 bits. Super Castlevania 4 had been fairly successful, especially in the US, but ultimately it turned out to be a one-off project, and the series spread across multiple secondary platforms, each offering its own interpretation of the Castlevania style. Rondo of Blood for PC Engine CD-ROM 2 was the best loved, and best, of these. Laden with detail and presenting players with branching pathways reminiscent of Castlevania 3. 1994's Bloodlines for Genesis would be nothing to sneeze at either, giving players a choice of two protagonists to play as right up front, and opening up different strategic approaches to combat accordingly as the distinct heroes made their way through some of the most technically impressive environments ever seen on Genesis. Castlevania Chronicle, by comparison, felt almost old-fashioned. It's distinctly designed in the fashion of the original Castlevania, following once again the journey of Simon Belmont through Dracula's castle. The beats and enemies of the original game carry over are largely intact. Even Simon's arsenal is almost entirely unchanged from the NES game, with the only new addition to his repertoire coming in the form of the Laurel, a costly item that refills a chunk of Simon's health bar in exchange for 10 hearts. Many locations have been copied verbatim from the NES original, which this game often uses to throw players off balance or subvert their expectations. Familiar bosses have new patterns and powers, and power-ups have been relocated, sometimes to be replaced with diabolical traps. But while you'll recognize the content and mechanics of the original Castlevania here, Castlevania Chronicles is about twice the size of the original game. Simon's quest spans eight stages instead of only six, and each one is quite a bit larger than the levels seen on NES, not to mention more challenging. Castlevania Chronicle manages to be nearly as taxing as Haunted Castle, though it manages to come by its difficulty level fairly, rather than by inundating players with unfair hits and cheap attacks. It throws in plenty of new material as well. In addition to the murky stretches of swamp that became a mainstay of the castle's underpinnings as of Castlevania 3, it expands the waterways at the castle's foundations and introduces all new areas as well, such as an area patrolled by haunted dolls. Overall, the general vibe of this journey, in which you only reach the castle proper halfway through the quest, and only after trekking through swamps and waterways, strongly echoes Castlevania's 3 and 4. Yet it also embraces the worst of the Castlevania franchise, perhaps in a bid for redemption, as you encounter hazards drawn directly from Haunted Castle along the way, such as the tree monsters and the stained glass wraith at the top of the first primary tower. Perhaps the element Castlevania Chronicles most owes to Castlevania 3 and 4 is its love of set pieces something also seen in 1993's other Castlevania release, Rondo of Blood. Sequences like the Sunken Ruins and the Clock Tower Gear Chase made a huge impact in the older games. And Chronicles throws them into the mix as early as the second stage, where players must survive a rapid ascent through a conduit of fishmen while riding a raft that quickly loses its integrity as it's damaged by the flood. The bosses play into this gimmickry as well. Particularly memorable is the Werewolf Battle, which takes place in front of a clock tower. But unlike the Clock Tower mummies in Super Castlevania 4, or Death and Rondo of Blood, the clock isn't just scenery. The boss makes full use of the background by ripping chunks of masonry and even the actual timekeeping Roman numerals off the face of the clock, using them as projectiles to demolish Simon. It's a great looking game that manages to embrace the overall feel of the original Castlevania and the rich visuals of Super Castlevania 4, and the brisk, no holds barred pacing of Dracula X. And it sounds incredible, offering three different renditions of its soundtrack depending on which audio options the player had equipped their X68000 with. Although the X68000 game never came to the US, because the computer failed to make its way here, a PlayStation port did arrive here in 2001 under the Castlevania Chronicles name I keep referring to. In addition to including a faithful conversion of the original, Chronicles also included an arranged mode with a few revamped sprites and rebalanced difficulty. That includes an easy mode that's probably the only way most people will ever see the ending. But even if you don't want to water down the damage enemies inflict, the Chronicles remix is generally just less punishing. For example, the remix reduces Simon's damage knockback effect, which makes the raft ride early on far more manageable than in its original incarnation. The original game is insanely difficult, Though again, it's in an engaging and interesting sense that encourages you to master its complexities, rather than in the haunted castle this is a bad game and I hate it sense. 
And that's been it, basically, for Konami's efforts to remake the original Castlevania. A few years after the X68000 release, the series went both Metroidvania and 3D, with the former titles carrying forward the storyline that had begun in 1986, and the latter frequently doing their own thing. It's hard to say if Konami's inevitable attempt to reboot Castlevania again will someday result in another remake of the NES game, or if they'll take another stab at coming up with some definitive prequel that tells the Belmont saga from the start with yet another forefather of the family we've never heard of. In any case, both the original NES Castlevania and every single one of these remakes outside of the MSX game are easily accessible today. The NES and Super NES games are available on Konami's Castlevania Anniversary Collection for modern platforms, while Haunted Castle is available on both Switch and PS4 arcade archives and the Konami Arcade Classics Collection. And at least for the time being, you can buy Castlevania Chronicles for PSP, PS Vita, and PS3 as a PlayStation 1 Network PS1 Classic. Though, who knows how much longer that's going to last, considering that PS5's backward compatibility only goes back one generation. Oh, you're still here. Well, okay, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one last take on the original Castlevania versus Castlevania for Nintendo's versus Unisystem. Unlike the other games here, this wasn't a reimagining of the game. It was literally just Castlevania for NES, but slightly different. Since it ran on Unisystem hardware, which had a distinct PPU chip from the NES, the game's color palette looked slightly different than the NES games. Mostly though, it was just a lot harder. Versus Castlevania wasn't some dramatic overhaul like Versus Super Mario Bros., which combined stages from two different games and switched around power-up locations. Versus Castlevania simply took the time-tested approach of making things insanely hard by tweaking variables to be unfavorable to the player. The time limit for each stage is cut by about 45%, which makes it incredibly difficult to make it from the opening of a level to its boss in a single life. Of course, enemy damage values are tuned likewise to do the same. Enemies hit twice as hard here, meaning that by the time you reach the third stage, enemies are hitting you for six points of damage rather than three, harder than anything in the NES game. The final two stages are basically ghosts and goblins. Two hits will kill you dead. It's an interesting side note to the franchise, and it's one that's happily been preserved for the ages by Hamster. They've released Versus Castlevania as part of their Arcade Archive series for Switch. Although it's pretty redundant when you can buy the original Castlevania as part of the Castlevania Anniversary Collection with a whole lot of additional games for about twice the price, there is something definitely appealing for Castlevania experts in playing a retuned version of the game that demands peak performance. If nothing else, it should certainly disabuse you of the notion that you are, in fact, any good at Castlevania. 